This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you all tonight. I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are meeting all here tonight on the traditional country of the Ghana people. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and we acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. An important part of Aboriginal culture is to pass information down the generations through storytelling and this evening we have come together to participate in and celebrate and reward a particular form, a very succinct form of research storytelling. My name is Sandra Orgeig and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies here at UniSA. On behalf of the senior leadership of UniSA, represented here tonight by Professor David Lloyd, Vice-Chancellor and President, Professor Joanne Seiss, Provost and Chief Academic Officer, Professor Marnie Hughes-Warrington, AO, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Research and Enterprise, Alan Brideson, Chief of Staff, various directors of our professional units, various executive deans, deans of research and professorial leads of our academic units, uh, and members of council. And also on behalf of Ms. Jacinta Thompson, uh, Executive Director of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre, I would like to welcome you all to the 2022 UniSA Three Minute Thesis Grand Final Competition, a really special event in the UniSA and Hawke Centre calendars. Welcome to our distinguished guests, to our judges for tonight's competition, our most valued donors, colleagues, supervisors, students, friends and family. Both here in the auditorium and to the several hundred colleagues and guests joining us online tonight via our live stream. And of course, most especially, please join me in a big welcome and thank you to our seven PhD finalists tonight. I'm absolutely delighted that after two years of running this event um, virtually, we have been able to come together again finally in person to celebrate this wonderful event and to celebrate our incredibly talented and impressive PhD students and their research. Our seven finalists here tonight represent our seven academic units and the very broad spectrum of research areas that we undertake here at UniSA, covering topics from skin cancer and brain health to brand advertising and South Australian history. These seven students are among the very best of our almost 1,000 PhD students having won their individual competitions within their academic units. Most importantly, they have gone above and beyond. They have worked incredibly hard and they have pushed themselves beyond their comfort zones to master the skills of effectively communicating their complex research to a non-specialist audience in three minutes. Effective communication is such an important skill in our current post-truth era, where researchers are fighting to have their message heard against a barrage of misinformation, beliefs and opinions from the likes of social media influencers and others peddling their self-interests in our community. We are so very proud of our finalists and it is a tremendous achievement to, be, to have made it here tonight. With respect to tonight's event, I'd like to especially acknowledge and thank Ms. Jacinta Thompson, Executive Director of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre, for again co-hosting this event with us and including it in the Hawke Centre's very popular and diverse public events program. A special thank you to all of the loyal friends of the Hawke Centre and any visitors from the public 
who may be new to these events. It has been an absolute privilege to work with the Hawke Centre team, Renee Jolly and Cara Zanotti, who have been so supportive and helpful. I would like to thank the many volunteers who are helping out tonight with a myriad of tasks to make everything run smoothly, and a special thank you to our amazing audiovisual and IT gurus, Adam Leahy and Shane McCarthy. And most especially, I wish to th thank and acknowledge Dr. Kirsty Turner, whose tireless efforts and fantastic organisational skills and attention to detail over many, many months have supported the academic units, have supported the finalists and myself and have brought this event here together tonight. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to your MC for tonight, the incredibly talented and accomplished Miss Julia Lester. Trained in music, in politics and education, her career has spanned journalism, teaching and commercial radio and television. Most of you will likely know Julia from her 30-year career as an ABC broadcaster, where she has worked as a journalist, a reporter, an interviewer, a live host, a producer and a musician. Talented indeed. Julia has emceed this event for us on a number of occasions in the past and is a great friend of both the Hawke Centre and UniSA. And we are tremendously grateful to Julia to have agreed to emcee this event again tonight. So please join me in welcoming Julia to the podium. Well, thank you, Sandy. And, um, you know, I'm really pleased to be emceeing this event again because I don't know whether you've been to one of these before, but it's a really fine event. I find, and I think you will by the end of tonight, it's truly exciting to hear smart and creative thinkers right on the front line of ideas and research sharing their work with us, as Sandy has said, in a way that we can understand. And I say we, meaning all of us, uh, with our very many different knowledges of the world, the way we look at things, the way we think about things. And of course, if you're listening to us, I think we have something like 700 plus people listening to us online. So wherever you are, you're very welcome tonight. And again, I also want to back up what we've just heard from Sandra saying, if you consider our world right now, attempting to deal with, for instance, the huge burden of climate change, living through a major pandemic, international tensions, while doing our best to function as a thriving, forward-looking society. I don't think I'm exaggerating in thinking, I don't think there's ever been a more important time where trusted experts, backed by empirical evidence and imagination, who can communicate their work to the rest of us have been more important. And would we really have got even this far in the world of COVID, for instance, if those who know could not communicate to those of us who needed to know? It was so clear. I'm not going to mention the world of post-truth because I can't stand the phrase, but I mean, of course you had to, and that in itself creates great challenges for all of us. So of course, leading edge employers in all areas of expertise, governments, think tanks, funding bodies, media, all need to know what fine, progressive work is going on in our universities. So I would like to thank UniSA um, and an enormous thanks to the international three-minute thesis community, which is huge for recognising this. In my early days in the media, it was actually pretty hard to find an expert who was prepared to talk to we plebs who didn't know much, might not have asked the right questions, and I can understand that. It's not easy to turn complex stuff into understandable stuff for the rest of us, but we've moved a long way. 
So I would especially like to thank the students that you're about to meet who want to share their work with us, with you. It's a courageous undertaking, not just to shrink years of work down to three minutes, I mean, how on earth can you? But then get up here and talk to you about it. So good on luck, good luck to everyone. So this is what's going to happen in the next hour or so. Seven PhD students, as you know, from Muni SA, at various stages, by the way, in their studies, have made it through to this grand final. Now that in itself is quite something. It's like, you know, like a real grand final. They have to kind of knock lots of people out of the way, gently speaking, to get here. Their areas of expertise are most wonderfully diverse, as you will see, and they will each make a presentation to you. Like any good grand final, there are rules. So, each of the grand finalists has exactly, and I mean exactly, a maximum of three minutes to present to us, a non-specialist audience, their complex research in a way that we can understand. If they go over three minutes, there isn't actually a big hook, but they are disqualified. And our timekeeper is Sandra Elias. Would you like to wave at us all, Sandra? She's very fully equipped. She's got all these things that she'll poke up and say, get off in a minute. Oh, she's high tech as well. So each speaker will present a single static PowerPoint slide, which you'll see up on the screen behind them. And so that's part of the communication as well, of course, a huge part. Uh, they can't use any extra electronic media or additional props. I'm sad to say they're not allowed to sing, I don't think. Our judging panel. Three of them are seated in the front row tonight, and it's a great honour to have all of them. The chair of the judging panel, Professor Caroline McMillan, AO, Chief Scientist of South Australia. Caroline, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Ryan McGlenahan, who is Director of Business Development at Fleet Space Technologies and a former alumni of UniSA, I find. Welcome, thank you. Also, Professor Craig Batty, where are you, Craig? Are you? Oh, there you are, you took your jacket off. <laughs> I said, you don't look like a professor. And he said, oh, I'm creative. I'm in the creative section. I don't want to look like that. <laughs> Executive Dean, UniSA, creative. Also, online, Julie Hare, Education Editor of the Financial Review, who joins us from Sydney, and then she will Zoom meet with the judges as they make their choices. After the presentations from our grand finalists, the judges will wander up the stairs, disappear into back rooms to make their deliberations, and they will award a first and a second prize. So while the judges are deciding, we're going to invite you, this is a bit later, uh, we're going to invite all of the finalists back on stage, and there'll be a kind of Q&A, a question and answer. So as you're listening, if you've got a question in mind that you'd like to put to one of them, please put that in your pocket as well. So, one more thing. The decision of the adjudicating panel is final. So there's nobody allowed to stand up and say, I don't agree. Well, let's do it, shall we? Let's commence the grand final of tonight's 2022 three-minute thesis grand final. You can see up there the judging criteria, which apply for you as well, was the idea communicated? What was the comprehension? How much did you understand? Did the person engage with you or were you half asleep? You know. I'm sure you won't be. This is a very splendid bunch. Let's do it, let's begin. I'd like to introduce our first finalist tonight. She's the courageous one, I think. Lainey Anderson, would you welcome her to the stage? I bet you didn't know South Australia was the first place in the British Empire to appoint women police on the same salary as men. Not only that, they also had the same powers of arrest. In 1915, an unmarried 40-year-old woman by the name of Fanny Kate Bodicea Cox began her policing career in Adelaide. 
She smashed drug rings and arrested white slavers, but most of the time she just walked the beat, rescuing women from themselves, from men and from abusive husbands. Distressed mothers were given to cry, call Miss Cox! Indeed, in her time, her work was so celebrated it was reportedly copied by the New York Police Department. Yet today, Cox has joined many once prominent women in becoming lost to history. And I contend that's because existing literature is primarily confined to three very short, one-dimensional biographies describing a saint, a stereotype. Kate Cox was shades of grey. I'm exploring how a popular historical mystery novel can do justice to her as a complex and significant figure in South Australian history. Yes, I'm writing a murder mystery. My method is fiction. My research-led creative practice will take the sparse facts and primary sources as far as they can go. Where the facts end, I draw on wider historical truths and informed imagining to describe who Cox was, how she felt, and why she was the woman she was. My novel will reveal a contradictory woman, both of her time and ahead of her time, a woman constrained by culture and at the vanguard of change. A woman, for example, who dealt daily with large families battling extreme poverty but didn't believe in birth control. A woman who beat young couples with a five-foot cane for canoodling but found ways for young unmarried mothers to keep their babies. South Australia led the world in women's policing. Why aren't we celebrating that fact? Or at the very least curious about the kind of society that wanted and needed a Kate Cox on the beat fighting crime and immorality. To shine a light on Cox is to rescue an era of women from the margins of history. To give voice to the forgotten gender of World War I Adelaide while also reflecting on our own constraints and biases and hopes for change. My fictional piece will allow Cox to be seen in all of her um, complexity and in the um, context of her time. Thank you, Lainey. Lainey Anderson from UniSA Creative. And our next grand finalist for you now, may I introduce you to Billy Setiawan from UniSA Justice and Society. Billy, welcome. Do you fancy a pint of beer? Page 45, English language textbook in Indonesia, talking about ordering alcohol in a foreign country. What's the problem with that? I know some of you like to have a pint or a schooner, especially in a hot summer day, but do you know that in Indonesia, for religious and cultural reasons, many of them don't drink alcohol? This is just one example of English language programs in Indonesia that don't take into account the local context and cultures. In the classroom, students are often asked to be someone else, like the Americans or the Australians, with conflicting cultural values, resulting in a fear of losing all languages, cultures, and identity while learning English. Studies show that neglecting students' local context results in their low proficiency and tensions in teaching and learning. There is a call for English language education to be more respectful to the local context in Indonesia, a country with more than 700 local languages and strong religious and cultural values. So, to address that issue, in my PhD, I'm looking at a different way of teaching English in Indonesia. I refer to what studies call intercultural orientation. Within this orientation, I treat students' languages and cultures as a point of departure of their journey in learning English. And instead of asking them to be Americans or Australians, I aim to build a bridge to connect them with the foreign world they were learning in English classrooms. And what is the bridge? Texts related to students' local context, questions that invite comparisons between English and their own languages and cultures, and classroom activities that allow students to revisit their languages and cultures while learning English. 
with all that in mind, I designed interventions, series of lessons with four university English teachers in Indonesia. And through extensive classroom observations, I discovered that this intercultural orientation, the bridge, enables students to move comfortably between English and their own languages. They were able to use English to express their cultural values, family traditions, and their aspiration to develop their hometown. One student even claimed that they spoke their own English accents, influenced by the local languages. How inspirational is that? My hope, my study could be a model to help millions of students like them in Indonesia, or even around the world, to safely cross the bridge while learning English without the fear of losing their cultures and identity. And they are able to use English as an additional language to their repertoire instead of replacing their existing languages and cultures. And instead of using English to order alcohol, they could comfortably say, can I rather have a glass of Tatarik, the Indonesian milk tea? Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Billy Setiawan from UniSA Justice and Society. Our number three grand finalist. Will you welcome Madison Mello from UniSA Allied Health and Human Performance. I would like to introduce Dave and Helen. They're both in their 60s, but they live quite different lifestyles. Dave is fairly active during the day, but tends to stay up late watching TV most nights, followed by a short and broken sleep. Whereas Helen sits for long periods at her desk during her day, but she does manage to squeeze in around 30 minutes of exercise in the afternoons and has a consistent and healthy sleep schedule. Both Dave and Helen recently read that around 40% of dementia cases are potentially preventable, and that even in their 60s, there are steps they could be taking to reduce their risk. They would like to know what changes they could make in their lifestyle to reduce their dementia risk. So where should we start? We know that physical inactivity is a modifiable risk factor for dementia in older adulthood. And this has been the focus of many previous dementia prevention strategies. But what about sedentary behavior and sleep? Because as you can see, together with physical activity, they also make up the 24 hour day. And they're both related to brain health and dementia risk in their own right. Dave is already fairly active, whereas Helen isn't so much, but Dave sleeps quite poorly and Helen sleeps fairly well, and they both spend their sedentary time in quite different activities. So would it make sense for us to recommend the same behaviour change for both Dave and Helen in order to reduce their risk of dementia? To design effective interventions, we need to consider all activities across the 24-hour day and not just one behaviour in isolation but we still don't know how the balance of all activities across the day impacts brain health in older adults. And that's where my PhD comes in. My research aims to understand how the balance of physical activity, sedentary behavior and sleep across 24 hours impacts brain health and cognitive function in older adults. So far, my research has suggested that yes, it is important to consider all activities, not only in terms of how much time we spend in each of them, but also how we spend that time. For example, my initial findings suggest that increasing time in physical activity and decreasing time in sedentary behaviour might have different effects on cognitive function depending on how people spend that sedentary time. So for people like Dave and Helen, simply recommending that they increase their physical activity alone might not benefit them both in the same way. Often in people who develop dementia, we actually start to see changes happening in the brain several years before any behavioural symptoms occur, like changes in cognitive function. So for my next two PhD studies, I'm going to be looking at whether 24-hour activity patterns are also related to outcomes like brain health, uh, sorry, brain structure and brain volume. By understanding how all activities across the day impact brain health in older adults, we can design effective 24-hour movement guidelines for dementia risk reduction that can be tailored to older adults with different lifestyles at baseline, just like Dave and Helen. Thank you. Thank you, Madison Mello from UniSA Allied Health and Human Performance. Our next finalist, will you welcome Leslie Johnson from UniSA Education Futures. Legendary musician George Gershwin once said, life is a lot like jazz, best when you improvise. And given that jazz musicians are known for their impromptu jam sessions, maybe he's onto something. 
You see, just like a group of musicians coming together to jam, teachers can collaborate over the very real problems from their everyday work. We call this a social learning space. Social learning is not like traditional professional learning. There is neither the recurrent, steady beat of the curriculum as a guide, nor the security of an expert at the front of the room visibly placed to lead. It's changing, it's free-flowing. It actually is a lot like jazz. In social learning, teachers can improvise. They can use the clashes from their everyday working context and the tensions created to, um, to to explore the tensions uh, within their everyday work. My research looks at teachers involved in a voluntary, um, oh, sorry. My research look at, looks at teachers from one independent school uh, involved in voluntary social learning. Through semi-structured interviews and regular, regular network um, surveys, we looked at what the teachers got out of this experience. Um, they found that their interaction um, was very useful. In 2020, we have nine teachers engaged in the network. In 2021, it was 57. You can see from these network maps that the interactions in 2020 uh, were a limited flow of, of information between the teachers and the group. However, in 2021, um, the interactions were organic, they were collaborative, um, and they were improvised in nature. In 2022, we have a further 30 teachers who are looking to be involved in the space. And to revisit the original jazz analogy, um, a significant proportion of the group are looking to get the band back together. Um, but that wasn't the only benefit that the teachers found from this type of professional learning. They also found a reinvigoration in their passion for teaching. They found that they were more connected and their confidence, confidence was increased. And they also found that they were better placed to um, use their learning day to day for their students. So, maybe old George was right after all. Sometimes it's best to go with the flow because that is where teachers learn best. Thank you, Leslie Johnson from UniSA Education Futures. May I now introduce to you our fifth finalist, Mohammed Rashid Saeed from UniSA Business. Welcome, Rashid. Imagine. Colgate introducing a range of ready-to-eat microwavable food. Would you perceive this new product less positively? Welcome to the world of low-fit brand extension. A low-fit brand extension occurs when an established brand uses its name to introduce a new product that is unrelated to its existing products. Brands often introduce low-fit extensions. For example, the vacuum cleaner brand Dyson extended to hair dryer. The brand Swiss Army went beyond knives to introduce watches and fragrances. Apple is also expected to introduce self-driving electric cars by 2027. By the way, Colgate did launch ready-to-eat microwavable food and it failed miserably. Why do brands extend to low-fit categories? In fact, low-fit extensions can offer new markets and growth avenues. They can also help companies to capitalize on emerging consumer trends and diversify sales risk. However, low-fit extensions are risky and often fail. Therefore, my research focuses on how advertising can help brands to promote low-fit extension successfully. For example, my research investigates how abstract appeals can help low-fit extension to be launched successfully, or whether a concrete appeal be more effective for a low-fit extension. Across four experiments, I asked participants to evaluate low-fit extensions of rail brands after seeing their abstract and concrete ads. 
I take one step further to test whether it matters if participants are planning to purchase soon or far into the future. My research shows that marketers should use abstract ads rather than concrete ads. However, concrete ads work better when participants are planning to purchase soon. As the success of low-fit extension is challenging, these findings can guide marketers on how to launch low-fit extension successfully. While my research does not directly help climate change, nor is related to social causes like poverty, it helps companies to be profitable, which in turn can increase economic growth, provides employment, and raises standards of living and the quality of life. So, in conclusion, the next time you see an ad of a toothbrush made by KFC, don't belittle the little ad. It might just be a better toothbrush. Thank you. Our thanks to Mohammed Rashid Saeed from UniSA Business. For our sixth grand finalist, will you welcome Jian Lam from UniSA Clinical and Health Sciences. Welcome, Lam. When was the last time you checked your mold? If you can spot any mold that starts changing color, size, or shape, you better get it checked because that's common sign of a melanoma, the most dangerous form of skin cancer. So among hundreds of mold we can have on our bodies, how can we tell for sure which one is a melanoma? It's very complicated, and melanoma is one of the most challenging cancer to diagnose. When a patient shows up with a suspicious mold, the GP will first cut out a small piece of sample and send it to the pathology lab. In the lab, the sample will be cut into very thin sections and put on the slide. A pathologist will look at the slide under a microscope and try to identify if there's any cancer cells present. To make this easier, they usually use some markers that have the ability to label the cancer cells, usually in different colors, and make them distinguishable from normal cells. The problem is that sometimes these markers do not label the cancer cells, or they can also label non-melanoma cells. As you can see from the screen, currently used marker in this particular case can only label some of the cancer cells in the light brown color, leaving the pathologist to ensure it is just a normal mode, a melanoma, or some other form of skin lesions. In these cases, misdiagnosis can happen, leading to delayed treatment, and even worse, it can claim the patient's life. So for my PhD project, I want to identify new markers that allow us to diagnose melanoma more accurately. We found that as compared to normal skin, melanoma have abnormal activity in a set of genes that are interconnected into the system called the endosomal system. Think about this system as a transport company that facilitates the trafficking of signal and materials to the right place at the right times in the cells. In melanoma, however, this system is hyperactivated and it keeps delivering excessive growth signal and nutrients to the cells to keep them growing and spreading. We believe that the alteration within the endosomal system play a very important role in melanoma initiation and progression. And by testing on the patient sample, using the same technique as the pathologist, we identified some potential markers that can be used to detect the cancer cell very precisely. As you can see from the screen, our newly identified marker can label all of the cancer cells in the sample with a very dark brown color. And this will allow the pathologist to be 100% sure this is a melanoma case. Four Australians die from melanoma every day. We hope that one day, our marker can be applied to clinical practice to assist the pathologist in detecting this silent killer before it's too late. Thank you. Thanks to Jian Lam from UniSA Clinical and Health Sciences. And may I introduce to you our seventh finalist, uh, Maria Vieira from UniSA STEM. Welcome, Maria. Please close your eyes and picture an engineer, a mathematician, a scientist, 
Now open your eyes and raise your hand if you imagine a man for most of the examples. Well, unfortunately, you were right. Women are largely underrepresented in science, technology, engineering, and maths, what we call STEM. They make up half of the Australian workers, but only 13% of the STEM qualified workforce. This is not only an ethical and sociological issue, but also an economic problem, as we know those professions are critical for the future economy. Now, why so few women in STEM? We know they face a series of barriers from early childhood to senior career that prevents them from progressing in this field. Stereotypes are one major barrier. A complex problem like this clearly doesn't have a simple solution. But what if we could make girls break down those stereotypes? Previous research says that creativity could help. I'm not suggesting here that engineers should paint and mathematicians should dance. I'm talking about creativity from the problem-solving perspective, which is core to any STEM profession. More specifically, I'm talking about a new concept called creative confidence which is this idea of trusting your own ability to solve a problem creatively and being persistent when facing adverse situations. There is strong evidence that by stimulating this creative confidence in young girls through activities such as design thinking, we can not only increase their interest in STEM, but also make them more prepared for the high paying jobs of the future. My research seeks to determine whether creative confidence can be, in fact, considered a gender issue and find possible ways to stimulate it in the context of education. This image was taken while working with schoolgirls during my data collection across South Australia. This data is still being analyzed, but look at their faces. They're so happy and so confident that I have no doubts my study is heading in the right direction. Thank you. Thanks to Maria Vieira from UniSA STEM. Well, how impressive was that? Can I firstly ask you to join me in thanking all of our finalists for your presentations? That's the really hard part, isn't it? Oh. Um, what I'd like to now do is to ask our judges to leave us. They will head upstairs to rooms in the back to decide the winner. So all the best in your deliberations. And I'd like to invite our finalists now to come and take your place on stage. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And we have people with microphones who can come to you with a, a mic to ask a question. There's a gentleman up in the middle with his brochure. Um, I've got a question for Mohammed Rashid Zayed. Why does the length of time from the purchase influence the effectiveness of the abstract versus the concrete ad appeals? Yes, th that's a good question. In fact, what happens when consumers are far from the purchase, or when they are planning to purchase later, they focus on abstract information more, and that's why abstract ad is more effective. However, when consumers are planning to purchase soon, they consider concrete information more relevant, and that's why concrete ad is more effective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. I, I had a question for Madison. You mentioned, I think, 40% uh, of uh, dementia cases are preventable. Uh, the other 60% not preventable? Uh, still largely unknown, unfortunately, but there are quite a few types of dementia that might have genetic risk. Um, so it's likely that most of that 60% is genetic. Um, but yeah, a lot of it's unknown still, unfortunately, but we're working towards it. Mm, good question. 
Another question. Thank you. We'll come back to you in a moment. Yes. Uh, my question's also for Madison. Um, you mentioned um, differences in sedentary behaviours, and I was wondering if you could um, expand on what some of those differences might entail. Yeah, sure. Good question. So when we talk about context of sedentary behaviour, um, if you think about all the different types of sedentary activities you do, they're not all equivalent in, what, in how they engage your brain or how they might affect your brain health. So, for example, thinking about TV watching, most of the time you're sitting there not thinking too hard or working your brain as such, um, versus if you're on the computer, you're thinking a little bit more and that it's more mentally engaging. So we compare um, sedentary behaviours in terms of how mentally engaging they are, and we tend to think that those that are more mentally engaging are better for your brain, um, which is still yet to be determined. So, yeah, I hope that explains it. Thank you very much. Yes, another question up here. Thank you. Um, my question's for Billy. Wonderful presentation. Um, if you could help reform foreign language education, what would it look like in five years' time? Yeah, um, thank you for the questions. Um, I've really loved uh, to be involved in the redevelopment of English language curriculum in Indonesia, maybe like working with um, the Ministry of um, Education and Cultures to um, incorporate this idea, this model, um, that is more sensitive to the local context. And I'm also hoping to see this model, this orientation uh, in the teacher's uh, professional learning development program, because uh, one of the other findings in my study, uh, the teachers were aware that they need this kind of orientation, but they don't know how to do that. So yeah, in terms of the redesign um, of the curriculum and also in the teacher's uh, professional learning development program. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Uh, yes, over here, the woman in the red cardigan, please. Oh, I did that when I got to the top, didn't you? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Maria, could you give us an example of the activities that you were setting up for the girls to do that are so creative? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, and it's good because it gives me the opportunity to explain a little bit more about the work I'm doing. So, um, those girls um, on the slide, they they're a group from Mount Gambia, and what they have in common is the fact that they decided to self-enroll to a creative challenge. And in this challenge, they come to UniSA, and they meet girls from different schools, different year levels, and they work together in a real-world problem posed by the industry. So, um, in this case, in a specific, the question was how might we increase the donations for the SA Museum? which is a science museum in the other side of um, North Terrace. And what they did um, in that case was to um, explore, so part of their work was to understand um, the problem definition, uh, ideate, so they understood that pollution was an interesting topic to explore for a science museum. And from there they um, brainstorm and they had amazing ideas till they get to the point that they built that prototype. And the prototype showed um, a vending machine, and this machine would sell um, jewelry and other nice products made by plastics recycled from the ocean. Um, so it was quite interesting because they did a really nice effort in understanding um, how feasible that idea was, so searching uh, companies in Australia that already do this work of recycling products that they could partner with. Uh, they created the little logo, and um, but more, more than actually understanding how feasible was the idea was understanding how excited they got about that. Um, and just as this group, I had more than 80 girls that did a very good job um, creating things. So very interesting. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, I'm really keen to get that book. So <laughs> when do you reckon it might be ready? Um, I'll get your number later. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> um, hopefully 2024. Lainey, can I ask you why you thought fiction would be the way through to sell this story rather than non-fiction? 
I just think this story lends itself so much to um, a work of fiction, a murder mystery. We, we saw just how the world embraced Priney Fisher um, in, in the Miss Fisher murder mysteries. And here in South Australia, we have a real life version who is far more interesting and complex. So uh, I, I want people who don't necessarily have never heard the name Co Kate Cox to be reading about her. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I've got a question for Lam. Um, as a child of the 70s and spending a lot of time in the sun, I'm wondering how useful um, the new markers are compared to those currently used in clinics. Um, so as compared to the currently used marker in clinic, so I can say that the sensitive sensitivities was improved that you can see from the picture I'm showing that it can detect some melanoma, whereas the other currently used marker cannot. Uh, and we're still working on testing it on different skin pathologies to see is it specific for melanoma or it can also work on other sky, um, lesions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? Thanks. Uh, my question's for Lainey. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. Um, my question is, how do you find the process of writing fiction within the formal structured context of a PhD program, as opposed to, I guess, the more traditional method of labouring away in isolation, as it were, without that kind of support framework in place? Um, right now, it's pretty similar um, to labouring away in isolation because um, and it, that it's been sort of designed that way by my supervisors who include the amazing Dr. Ben Stubbs, who's up in, in the crowd here, but also um, Nicholas Jose, um, who is a fabulous fiction and non-fiction writer um, based here in Adelaide. Um, and also Professor Susan Luckman, who's amazing and watching online as well. But um, my first job after finishing my research proposal was to finish the first um, draft of my abstract and I'm probably, I'm two, uh, I'm halfway through my PhD and I'm two chapters away from finishing that. And that's where the real, the PhD, the real research led creative practice I think will come in um, where it gets much more um, rigorous and arduous and making sure that I'm really getting to the nitty gritty of the complexity of Kate Cox and making sure I'm not being judgmental, but not being an apologist and making sure that's woven into my, the fictional narrative arc, but all of the, the, the true to Kate Cox elements are, are in there, so for everyone to see and learn about her. If, if, I hope that answers it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, yes, my question is for Leslie. First of all, uh, well done for persevering. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so my question is, you talked about the difference between social learning and more traditional professional learning. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the traditional professional learning looks like? Sure. So for any teachers in the room, um, if you say uh, we've got a PD day, which we have at, at school tomorrow, um, teachers have in their mind, oh, okay, there's going to be someone standing at the front of the room and they're going to be doing something to us. Okay, so we're going to be passive recipients of knowledge. Um, and so social learning isn't like that, it, is a, it, it sort of upturns the, the hierarchy in terms of um, who the expert is and the experts actually are the teachers themselves because they are experts in their context. Um, so it's not like uh, traditional professional learning where there's, a, there's content to be relayed and then you can take that back to your classroom and maybe do a little bit of it. It's, it's more authentic, it's more integrated with practice, it's, um, it's more real life. Yes? Mine is a, a kind of double-barreled question. Um, first of all, was was Miss Cox the only woman who was in the police force? And if she was, how on earth did she do that? Yeah. Um, she was handpicked um, by the um, police commissioner of the time in 1915, and she was asked how many women she wanted, and she said, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do yet, so just give me one. So it started off with one, but within a couple of years, 
uh, there was a quintet, the Invincible Quintet they were called, and they, they worked 60 hour weeks, they had one Sunday off every six weeks, and um, they walked the beat in one and a half inch heels and long skirts and long jackets, and with her five foot cane, they, they uh, not until the 1920s they were allowed a little, a little gun. Um, and yeah, so it must have been incredibly difficult, but um, she really was a household name. Well, all throughout, um, most, most until sort of her, her death in, in the 1950s. Yeah, she, she worked, she had to retire in 1935, but then she started the mother, Mothers and Babies Home. So she really was a household name. A question down the front here. Do you want to wait for a microphone to come to you? Oh, there's one here. There's one here. Hi. While Lainey's got the microphone, uh, my question is, how did you come about um, finding out about Kate Cox and why did you want to pursue your uh, PhD about her? Thank you. Um, well, like most history in South Australia, you learn from Keith Conlon. So <laughs> I was looking, I was looking from a, for a female protagonist and I was looking um, to write around this era, like the World War I era, because it is so um, dominated by male history. Um, all Australian history in that era is um, really um, dominated by, by male stories. And of course, you know, 60,000 young Australian men sacrifice their life. So, you know, maybe there's a good reason for that. However, when I heard about her, I just thought, bang, there's my female um, lead protagonist and um, yeah, and I just thought, wow, the world needs to know about this woman and her complexities, yeah. Lan, can I ask you a question? If your system were to be working and I wanted to go along and check out a mole on my neck, what would it mean as a patient? How would that be? Um, so, thank you for the questions. Um, so, the app the direct application for this one is that it can go to the clinics so that the pathologists can use it in their lab as I explained the process. So you have better chance to get the direct diagnosis as compared to the failure with that we are facing at the moment. So you have better diagnosis which can lead to better prognosis which means that you can get the treatment that you needed before the cancer start to metastasize to anywhere else. And we're also looking, because we're getting to know more about the biology of this marker and how it's working on, in melanoma. So we, ho we hope that we can also have better treatment as well in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. So who's got a microphone? Yes, up the back. Hello, um, my question's for Leslie. Um, after doing a few weeks of home learning with the kids, um, over COVID, it was just awful. Um, and so I've got a lot of respect for teachers. Um, but I was just wondering, under that pressure cooker of COVID and what teachers would have been experiencing during the period you were conducting your research, um, do you feel that there was a greater need for that peer network or do you feel there were, it was more um, people potentially putting their hands up to be involved, or what was the impact of that? Yeah, it's really interesting because we, this is the third year now that we've run this sort of social learning um, space, and we thought that this year we would see reduced numbers because teachers are so under the pump, uh, and we were really surprised that we got, you know, unprecedented numbers of um, teachers from, our, from one school, 30 teachers, so the research is only within one school, it's, it's a college with five campuses, but uh, we thought, you know, we're hardly going to get anybody this year. And we, we, got, we got 30, and that was really surprising. And it seems that teachers know that something else is coming, something different is coming. There's a necessity for them to change up their practice, and they don't know what next. And so this is really, I think that this has shown um, that there is really a need for it, there's a call for it, and to be able to connect and get together and really push the edges of their understanding so they're not relying on an expert um, and, a, and an off-the-shelf off program to come and sort of save the day. Uh, they don't need to be fixed, teachers don't need to be fixed, students don't need to be fixed. It's about what works in our context and, and what's best for our students. So, so yeah, to answer your question, there is, there is a real uh, demand for, for what we're doing and um, you know the, what the teachers are getting out of it is a renewed 
um, a reinvigoration of their passion for teaching. I mean, it, we only need to look at what's happening with discourse around teaching at the moment to see that teachers are leaving the profession in droves and, um, you know, citing burnout and talking about, you know, the pressures of admin. And so to be able to reinvigorate that passion for teaching is something I think that, that's very, very valuable. Thank you. Last question. Yes. A gentleman down the front with the green scarf. So my question is for uh, Billy. Um, I was brought up in very Anglo-Australia. I spent four years in Malaysia um, as a volunteer and my cultural bridging was primarily around food because I had to eat. When I came back to Adelaide in 1975, what I knew wasn't much use in Adelaide. But it's happened. People know what, you know, uh, Nasi they, 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 they know what rendang is. It's all happened. Um, but it becomes deeper than that. How do you propose in your bridging language and the culture to get a bit beyond sort of food and traditional dancing uh, and actually start to say a difference in mindset behind the different countries? Yeah, um, I hope I can respond to that properly. Um, yeah, so I'm using this um, kind of examples from, from food um, or drink, uh, just like one of the examples, but again, the, the issues are like much deeper uh, from that. Um, because like, you know, in um, the current um, curriculum in Indonesia for language programs is like sort of like monolingual and what I want to um, bridge here is like, um, because the students also have um, their own languages and cultures and how like in the English um, language program, while they learn um, the English language, they can also reflect on their own um, languages and cultures. Um, yeah. I hope that kind of like um, answers the question. Sorry, I'm still you know, like recovering from <laughs> my presentation. <laughs> Thank you, nice question. Hi there, my question is for Madison. Um, just wondering why you wouldn't have included nutrition as part of your 24-hour uh, pie. Sorry, why I didn't include nutrition? Didn't include nutrition. Uh, I haven't included it in my PhD, but in our broader study, we are looking at diet as well. Um, so we're also looking at diet composition, so all the parts of the diet and how they fit together. Um, I just didn't have time to fit it in my three minutes, um, and it's not in my PhD directly, but we're definitely considering it. Thank you. Hi, my question is to Leslie. I was wondering if you've seen a movie called Another Round, a Danish movie. Yeah. Um, it might be of interest. It's the story of four teachers in Denmark who decide to do an, a social experiment and drink alcohol before going to school every morning. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> and, and the purpose is, so they, they really specify a certain amount to drink and the purpose is to loosen up, be more creative, be more engaging with their students and other teachers. Um, so, unfortunately, the end is not quite <laughs> funny, but I just thought that, that could fit in quite well with your, with your um, thesis. No, I haven't seen it, but it sounds very interesting. Yeah. Um, look, one thing that is very important in the space is trust, high trust and uh, low formality. Uh, so, you know, maybe alcohol will do that. Um, but, but we make a point of, where, and, and I don't know if I got to this part or if I missed it out <laughs> um, when I was presenting, but this is voluntary, okay? So these teachers are coming to this space voluntarily on a Thursday night after a full day of teaching, yard duties, you know, meetings, and they come in and you, you do see them reinvigorated walking out the room. You know, they're walking with their shoulders back a bit more, their chests out a bit more, like they've got this increased confidence. And, and there's something in that space that, that's really special, something intangible that's in that space. And, you know, our school, the men have to wear ties, ties are off, you know, there might be a bottle of wine sometimes that's opened, but it's, it's about that real leveling of the hierarchy. So, so titles don't matter in that space, job descriptions don't matter in that space, it's the coming together and really saying, how do we do this better for our students? How do we um, push forward what we currently understand? Because nobody has the answers to this in our context. We need to really understand what are we doing and why are we doing this for our students? So um, yeah, maybe, I, I don't think we'll be drinking before school, but I, I, I would like to see that movie. 
This question is to Maria. I actually got two questions. The first question is, uh, in my opinion, PhD research is multi-discipline. So what kind of scientific journal or referee journal articles have you reviewed from other disciplines about creative confidence? And the second question is, have you found any journal articles about increasing the creative confidence in refugees and migrants for them to fit into the society? It's not only for Australia. Thanks. Big questions. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, definitely my project is very multidisciplinary, so it sits in the intersection of um, STEM education, creativity and gender equity. Um, so yeah, I did an extensive uh, literature review in this sense to uh, see what's being said in this space. And there is a, a little bit of research um, coming from a more experimental side, and so I'm trying to move that to a more statistical side of this um, specific content. I'm not sure if I responded to your question. Um, and uh, no, I, I never seen anything related to creative confidence applied to refugees, but it would be definitely very interesting um, to see how that would fit. So yeah, thanks for the question. Rashid, may I ask you a question? Yes. I was deeply yes, fascinated please. with the idea of a vacuum cleaning company moving to a hairdryer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They've been a little bit nervous, but I know they're... <laughs> <laughs> one's blowing and one's sucking. <laughs> so, in your research so far, um, they are both, of course, moving air. Is it wiser, if a company is going to expand its produce, to stick close to what you're already, already doing? or to leap and really push the boundaries? Yeah, thank you for this question. In case of Dyson, yes, they are trying to extend into categories which have some kind of connection with air, like they have introduced fans as well. And, but they recently launched Desk, which is not having any kind of air. So the idea of low fit extension is it hardly fits into the existing product categories of the brand. So yeah. don't move to lipstick uh, and vacuuming, probably. Uh, That's mean, a very it, bad it, example, it, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, it depends, I mean, how they execute uh, yeah. their advertising. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Do we have more questions? I want to go back to Lam again. Lama, I know that Obviously, for Australia, with our love of the sun, our sun, our foolishness, perhaps when we are in the sun, where is Australia placed at the moment in useful, speedy recognition of melanoma because it's such a serious thing for us? Yeah, so actually in Australia, we have like the top of the world. So like we have the highest incident rate of this cancer among all the other country in the world. So yes, we have like on the top of the world at the moment, yeah. And in terms of being able, therefore, to try new things, does that mean we are an open, interested market or we are closed with our ideas? Mm, I think the idea of finding the new market is always there. Like, it's not a new thing, but we are looking in a new perspective, I have to say. Uh, we're looking to understand more about uh, biologies of the cancer, and from that we find the marker suitable, not in the other way that we jump in finding the yeah. marker and don't understand what it does in the cancer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, oh yes. Mr. Woodward used to teach me at school, good grief. <laughs> <laughs> and we're both still alive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we remember that, 2468, we won't segregate. Yep. <laughs> uh, Lainey, uh, did you consider Muriel Matters? There was no crime in her story, but she was colourful. Yeah. Uh, yes, she was amazing. I mean, really, you, there's a hundred 
200, 300 women you could choose and write an amazing story on thousands. But um, for some reason, Kate Cox has got hold of me and I need to, you know, get her out. I just spent the last uh, week up in the far north of South Australia, a very isolated, fantastic, a place called Grindle's Hut. And there was a murder at Grindle's Hut back in the early 1900s. And it occurred to me so many families, men and women, living in those deeply, deeply isolated places back in the early 1900s, 1800s. And so much unpleasant behaviour would have just been buried. There must be some great stories in there. I'm sure you'll find them. Yes. Book, book two. Book two. <laughs> Billy. When you're trying to change the way that we do the language thing, you mentioned when we were just meeting each other the other day, the concept of you going to a language school in Indonesia and uh, your parents being understandably horrified when you came home saying, I'm learning how to ask to order a beer because they didn't drink. And are we still making screamingly awful mistakes like that? Or are we getting closer to more realistic and culturally understandable language learning? Um, yeah, um, I would say that um, unfortunately um, we still have this kind of like native speaker orientation in um, English language education in Indonesia and some other contexts as well. And I think uh, that we need to sort of like change the way we see like languages, the way we see the relationship between languages and cultures, and the way we see like how language should be taught in the, um, yeah, um, in such contexts. So that's where like, um, yeah. I'm so where do you start though? Mm -hmm. Do you think, where do you start? Yeah. Um, because this orientation is also like more personalized and more contextualized. That, um, and I'm working very closely with the teachers in Indonesia. So I work with them like for the whole year, last year. So I started with like um, preliminary in uh, interviews. I asked, so what do you think about uh, the current curriculum? Like what changes do you want to see in your classrooms? And then from there, I designed the interventions because they themselves came up with a lot of ideas. I want my students to find the learning more meaningful and then we work together. So um, it's up uh, with the teacher and so with what they think necessary to provide to their students in the classrooms. So it's almost language school by language school, word of mouth. Is that how it's going to spread? Um, yeah, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping, um, you know, like we start from there, but um, I'm really hoping that this could be like, again, um, the model to work with um, those working in um, maybe like the uh, curriculum developers so proposed uh, this kind of like idea, this kind of a new orientation, new model um, in Indonesia. And shock us with really bad mistakes that we've made. Oh, goodness. Does anyone else have a question? I'm hogging them a bit here. Yes. Billy, have you considered that your findings might have implications far beyond the English language? To give you an example, I have a daughter in year 11 who's studying French, and she says, Mom, I couldn't f ask for a way in French but I know all about the drug and alcohol problems in France. So why is this such a disconnect between teaching other languages in a meaningful way? Like, why? Yeah, um, thank you for the questions. Yeah, in fact, it's not only for English language education, but it could apply to uh, foreign language, other languages, um, education as well. In fact, in South Australia, my supervisors have been working with School of Languages uh, to, you know, like implement this orientation in their uh, more than 23 um, language programs in South Australia. Yeah, so it's, um, it can go beyond just English language programs. Is that working? Yeah, there we go. Maria, you say could use a few more women in engineering as students. Have you learned anything that could help us attract them? Sorry, can you 
Okay, I think we only Say got half again. of your... Yeah, I'm sorry. No, that's not, that's not your problem. Just try. I know it was funny, but I didn't understand. No, 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 I wasn't trying to be funny. Uh, genuinely interested in attracting more women into STEM at UniSA. Is anything in your research giving us any lessons on what we can do ah, to attract yes. more women into STEM? Yes, at the tertiary level. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, obviously, we know that girls make decisions that they're not good at STEM very early in life. So, that's what we are trying to, um, to work with with my study. So, I'm pretty much focused on girls from years 9 to 12. But, um, obviously, this is going to have a positive impact um, later in the future when they decide their career. And, um, yeah. We're probably talking 10 years really, before you yeah. could see a big change, which is pretty slow, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I got a question for Lam. Um, so what is the novel biomarker that you have um, discovered? And you know, what's its proposed mechanism in terms of finding melanoma? Um, okay, um, so we did find a set of potential marker that can be used to detect melanoma and they are all interconnected into the system called the endosomal system. Uh, but the name of the specific marker I cannot disclose at the moment because for some commercial conflicts, <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> but yes, so they are very potential to be applied to clinical practice. Good answer. Well done. Yeah, yeah, good question. <laughs> I'd like to go back to uh, Lam again, if I could. Oh, yes. While you've got the microphone. Um, we're talking about gender in various sciences. In your experience of science, what got you interested? You mean in terms of gender? Like... Oh, yeah, as a, as a young woman. Um... I'm not sure like for the whole STEM discipline, but at least for where I'm working with, I think it's a very great balance, at least for my view, I guess. Have you always been interested? Yes, I think, I think it's like science always interesting for me, since I was in high school as well. So yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Is that what you find, Maria, that there are some girls who just love it anyway, but we're talking the majority, you're thinking, are just put off early on. Sure, surely it's, aren't we just talking about teaching and better teaching? That's an awful phrase, yeah. I know. Yeah, it's a whole combination of factors. Yeah. So um, having role models, so uh, STEM teachers that show them that they can also be in STEM. And a chief um, scientist who's a woman, for instance, yes. Exactly. Um, also, um, giving them this confidence that um, they don't need to, to make a choice, that STEM allows them to be creative as well, and re redefining the concept we have um, for creativity as well. So, um, yeah, and understanding that pretty much in any profession nowadays, we kind of use a little bit of STEM anyway, so... Well, can I firstly thank you for your questions and may we once again thank our contributors. So this is where we're up to. Come and please, please join us, Caroline. Our judges have considered and you have been online with our judge in Sydney. We have, we have three prizes to give out or three awards and um, Caroline, let's firstly go with the People's Choice Award. And a reminder, as you can see up there, the People's Choice Award is going to offer a $1,000 research travel grant. Well, so, the People's Choice. That's pretty impressive. That's, uh, how many people were zooming in? That, that's a lot of people. <laughs> That's a lot of people. That's fantastic. So, without more ado, the people's choice is Muhammad Rashid Saeed.
Congratulations, Rajiv. Thank you, Caroline. And next we will find the second prize winner, $1,000 Research Travel Grant will be awarded here. And the news is, the result is. The result da, 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 da. is. Oh goodness. So after the People's Choice Award, the runner up, um, Mohammed Rashid <laughs> Saeed. <laughs> Congratulations. And for our winner, so as again you can see out there, the first prize winner will be the UniSA entrance to the 22 Asia Pacific 3MT final, and also the recipient of a $3,000 research travel grant. So, Professor Caroline McMillan, the first prize. I'm for the drum roll. <laughs> Great. Right, okay, um, I just want to say what a remarkable, absolutely remarkable series of presentations that uh, we all agreed that we heard uh, tonight. The variety, the depth, the clarity, the stories told were just simply, just absolutely uh, top class, just first rate. Uh, it's a credit to each of the finalists. It's a credit to the period of time that they've spent. We know you've spent different times um, really getting to grips with that research. And we all commented that most of us wanted to have changed what we did for our PhD because of it. <laughs> we just wanted to do what you were focusing on. Um, we just, um, we, it took us a while, you noticed, <laughs> and that's because it was a remarkable field. So, uh, without any more ado, the first place in the UniSA three-minute thesis competition grand final goes to Lainey Anderson. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, Caroline. Would you, I'd like to ask all of our finalists, would you just stand where you are, uh, all of the people who presented tonight, and will we give them another round of applause? Thank you. I have, uh, thank you very much, you can take a seat. I've emceed a few of these, and that's the longest the judges have ever taken for a long time, and I agree, what a fabulous variety of, uh, of pieces. <laughs> well, what, a, what an evening. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for voting. Uh, thank you very much for those who teach. I'd like to thank UniSA for getting it, for understanding what this is all about, and for putting such a lot of effort behind it, and the Hawke Centre as well. And that's the formal end of this part of our evening. All the best. We'll see you next year. <laughs>